Thank you. Hello. So uh, I've had the, uh, the privilege, uh, and it, it really is a pleasure, to read uh, the book. Not everyone in the room has done so yet. Bad sure they, people. Sure they will. Bad, bad people. Uh, the, uh, the, the life and times about which you write are, I think, much too, much too rich uh, a vein uh, to be mined in, in a brief conversation. So I'm going to sort of jump around. Uh, jump. And ask a number of questions about uh, perhaps smaller things uh, that I found particularly uh, interesting and notable uh, in the book in no particular order, except for the first question, which is notable for our place here in Philadelphia, as you mentioned. Uh, you did a piece about Thomas Jefferson in oh. enduring uh, editing by committee mm -hmm. of the Declaration of Independence. Yes. Uh, and you noted one change which was made that particularly pained him. Yes. Can you tell our audience what that is? We could have been such friends together. Jefferson was a great writer. When it came to the Constitution, he didn't really want to be in those fights that much. And oddly enough, he, but he was to some degree. And oddly enough, when it came to the revolution itself, he didn't necessarily want to be holding arms in that one. But he wrote the Declaration of Independence with the help of so many people, including uh, uh, John Adams but, and Ben Franklin, but he was, as you well know, the primary drafter of one of the greatest documents in human history. The Declaration of Independence drafted not far from here. All right, Jefferson is a young man. He was 33 years old. He was a young writer. He knew he was a great writer. In fact, on his gravestone at, stone at Monticello, there are a number of ways he could have described himself, but the first word on that gravestone under his name is writer. So you can imagine how important it was to be a writer, to be writing one of the great documents, to be pouring his head and his brain and his passion and his heart into it, but then having to give drafts of it to these fabulous other geniuses the members of the genius cluster that invented our nation. According to David McCullough, whose research in this area I think is the most solid, the most compelling, Jefferson rarely protested or cried or hit the table when big cuts were made in his declaration. But he actually protested a beautiful part of the declaration in which he addresses England. He is America, he addresses England. And after listing the degradations of King George III and the Parliament of England, Jefferson cried out in this passage, we had such wonderful history together. In the future, we could have been such friends together. And when you read it, it, it hits your heart like an arrow. Indeed, we could have been such friends together, but it is the moment when you know this cool, even chilly character. Mr. Jefferson wrote also with his heart, not only his head. It was cut from the document, probably in part for reasons of space, probably because, you know, the men editing the Declaration of Independence were not into declarations of affection and emotion towards England at the moment. You know, things always get cut, not for one reason, but for various reasons. But it's so interesting you should mention that, because I love that piece, because it's about a writer loving his work because he loves what he was saying. And, and also about the, the, the truth, even, of ideas that get edited, because, of course, we became such great friends. Yes, so, yes. Um, obviously, you were particularly close to President Reagan. Um, you say about him in the book that he was, quote, the last unambiguously successful president. So I want to ask you a couple things about that. First, what in your view earns him that description? Uh, do you believe it was his extraordinary strengths as you see it, uh, or perhaps weaknesses uh, that you see in those that have followed him? Um, and secondly, uh, do you think we can have in our current politics another unambiguously great president? I believe there is 
there has not always been Reagan nostalgia. There is great Reagan nostalgia in the United States now. I know it. I hear it all the time. I get it in my email when I appear. People say, when will we have another Reagan, which is a question that makes me slightly impatient. It sounds like somebody in 1901 saying, oh, when will we have another Lincoln? <laughs> Stop that. You're not going to have another Lincoln, but Teddy Roosevelt is down the block. Go help him. Do you know what I mean? There's greatness around you. All right. I believe what is behind Reagan nostalgia, which didn't begin the day he left office, but began in the middle of the 2000s. I know this because I'm on the road a lot talking to Americans. It began in the middle of the 2000s when people started to think this thing isn't working. By this thing, Republicans meant the Bush administration, but Democrats meant that also. And they were thinking, when was the last unambiguously great two-term presidency? And they would all, Democrats and Republicans, go back to Reagan. The reasons, it's not because he was charming and funny and a lovely human being and decent. It has to do with things like, oh, the wall came down. Oh, the Soviet Union was defeated. Oh, the American economy was lifted from the doldrums and made something uh, that could work again. Oh, high tax, uh, the highest individual tax rate went from 70-something to 20-something. Oh, the American military was rebuilt. These are all serious and substantive uh, achievements that you can point at for that eight-year period and add to that the fact <coughs> that Reagan had the character and nature of a leader. He did not embarrass you in front of the world. He did not humiliate you. He did not cause scandal, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So he is the last unambiguously great president. Not only do I believe, but I think the polls show the American people believe this. Uh, uh, can there be another one? I'm always in the school that says, of course. Somebody can come along, govern well, shrewdly, wisely, strongly, honestly, in a reliable way. Let me say a last thing about Reagan. One of the things I saw on this book tour, and I wrote about it somewhere, I can't remember, maybe a columnist, that people on my tour would always mention Reagan, and they would always mention his optimism, and say that was his power, his optimism. Wasn't he an optimistic guy? And the first time I let it go, and the second time I said, you know, I got it to an interview. I said, I got to disagree with you. Reagan's power was not optimism. Reagan, in fact, was confident. He was confident in himself. He was confident in you. And he was confident in the American systems and arrangements that allowed our government in its own rough way to work adequately in the world. <laughs> He had confidence, and he walked. when he walked into the room, we all looked at him, saw it, and that allowed us to feel optimistic. He was not optimistic. He was confident. He allowed us to feel optimistic. That's power, and that's someone with a genius for, I know how to do this. So by contrast, uh, you call President Obama the loneliest president since Nixon. Um, can you explain the basis of that description? Do you know people keep asking about that column, and I keep forgetting what it was exactly that made me say that. But um, I'm telling you quite honestly, but, but uh, Obama always seems to me alone out there doing the Obama thing in a very singular and specific and alone way. He is highly unusual as a president in that he keeps around him the smallest and tightest little group of advisors, most of them from Chicago. They are real <coughs> political advisors. He tests everything against these people. This is not a guy who, like every previous president I have watched or known, reached out of his bubble and called this guy and that woman and went to see this one and got this one in. It's too tight, it's too lonely, it's too constricted in there. It's bad for him, it's hurt his presidency. 
Let's go back uh, to uh, what Bob mentioned and perhaps the thing you're most known for, the, the, the Challenger speech. Uh, you, the book includes a lecture that you gave at Harvard about writing uh, the speech. Um, you say that you relied on that critical day when time was so short. You relied on a hunch. Uh, can you tell our audience what that was and how it worked? Briefly, the, um, the Space Shuttle Challenger explosion was obviously unexpected, obviously shocking, and rattled the Reagan White House. I mean, we were all watching it. We're all proud of our space program. We've been proud of our space program for 30 years. It was something wonderful that gave us always beautiful progress and a sense of pride and moving onward. Suddenly this thing explodes right in the air in front of everybody, live TV. I was in the White House, I had the TV on. Suddenly the TV goes silent. I could see something funny on the TV screen. I put up the volume and all you could hear was this static, this creepy static, because Mission Control and NASA didn't know what had happened, so they had nothing to say. And then they started to say these funny bureaucratic words that sounded like, oh my God, we don't know what happened, but we think we just saw it explode. In the White House, we were supposed to have the State of the Union speech that night, meaning everybody's attention was on that, but the work was all done. So frankly, in speech writing, we were having a nice, quiet day. I knew the president was going to have to speak as the story unfolded. I knew that, that it was just going to have to be done. I went to my boss and I said, I've started work on this. He said, thank you, God. Good. Go. He's on the phone with everybody, you know, fielding a million things. The president's on the phone with NASA, with foreign leaders, with tr handling the whole situation. Woman from the National Security Council ran into my office. She had just spent about 20 minutes with the president. She in his office and had a meeting with Anchorman. She wrote down everything he said. That became the spine of the speech. She ran into my office with her notes. I suppose they're out in the Reagan Library. I worked from that. I worked from imagination. As I was watching on CNN, the tape that they kept playing over and over and over again of these poor astronauts who we knew were very likely dead. As they, the last time we saw them, was when they were taken from their NASA uniform station out on the little bus to the takeoff pad. And in this film that they kept showing over and over, the astronauts were merrily waving goodbye in their, in their heavy gloves. As I watched that, I just remembered a poem I had learned as a kid. It's the poem High Flight by John Gillespie McGee Jr. It's about the joy of flying. And it ends with the words, um, my gosh, I'm, block, I'm blocking. Say it again. Slipped the surly bonds of earth to touch the face of God. And I just thought, that, you know, that's just, that's the end of this speech. <clears throat> and I wrote it in a way <clears throat> that I thought it would work. But I had no chance to talk to Reagan, and I knew Reagan is not going to use that quote. He's, he's not going to say that unless he knows that poem. Okay, does Reagan know this poem? I don't know, but I have a hunch maybe he does. It's the end of the speech. Speech goes through a very truncated, shortened staffing process, meaning nobody had enough time to screw it up. The president had to speak very, very quickly. I mean, I sound like... This is Thomas Jefferson. The great part about England got in because no one had time to screw it up. But really, sometimes in life, when nobody has time to screw it up, it works. Speech comes on. Reagan looked so just. Reagan looked dashed. He looked sad. And he's talking to the country.